Okay, I'd like to talk now about the concept of ecosystem services, which are um, the benefits that humans derive from nature. And, uh, you know, nature is one way of saying it. The world around us is another way of saying it. It's uh, uh, the benefits that we get from photosynthesis. It's the benefits we get from decomposition. It's the benefits we get from our agriculture. Um, there really is no limit to um, uh, how we want to bound it. Uh, the concept has been around for a long time, but it was really um, brought to the fore around the turn of the 21st century when the, uh, a group called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was an international group of scientists, about 2,000 scientists who were charged, uh, got together because they were charged um, <clears throat> with developing a report that um, uh, reported on the status of the world's ecosystems. And so one of the things they did in there was first lay out this framework of ecosystem services, uh, which became very influential and very important, especially in the ecological literature and the ecological discussions. Uh, and I'll talk about why that became so important. Um, prior to the concept of ecosystem services being so um, pushed so far, hard to the fore, to the forefront, um, we used to talk about things like ecosystem goods, which now are called ecosystem provisioning services. So ecos ecosystem goods in the, in the sort of, in the old 20th century parlance uh, referred to things that um, <clears throat> we get from nature that have markets explicitly developed for them. So you can see here under the category of provisioning ecosystem services, we talk about food and fuel and fresh water, et cetera. These are things that we explicitly pay for on markets uh, and, and markets that have been developed over time. And so in the past, maybe those were referred to as goods and all these other things that you see listed here as regulating cultural and supporting services were just sort of considered ecosystem services. These are the things we get from nature, but we don't necessarily pay for them. And um, one of the important points that this group made was that we need to, uh, think about how we're going to pay for those services moving forward. And that's one of the ways that we're going to uh, improve the environment and the world around us. Uh, I do want to walk through um, what's in the green and blue boxes here. And uh, we'll start out with uh, the four types of ecosystem services that have been categorized. And those are supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural services. <clears throat> and as I mentioned already, Provisioning services tend to be those things that we used to call ecosystem goods that have had markets explicitly developed where people buy and trade uh, products. Uh, these are um, these products um, ultimately have their, as their basis um, things that come out of out of ecosystems, you know, plant and animal products in particular, water uh, um, and that sort of thing. But they're things that we uh, tend to have a pretty clear way of valuing uh, and, and, and are able to put a dollar value on pretty easily. Other services like regulating services become a little bit trickier and you have probably heard about the concept of uh, carbon markets, uh, maybe even nutrient markets you've heard of. Uh, these are things that we're really struggling to value um, so carbon markets in particular are um, part of the conversation these days because um, we see one of the important uh, opportunities to help stabilize climate, to help regulate the climate, to be getting carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it below ground, uh, to be getting carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into woody biomass, to put it places where it's going to help stabilize our climate. And so folks have been trying to develop market schemes for that. And it's, been, it's proven very difficult for lots of reasons that we can come back to in discussion. But regulating services um, are, are super important because um, they sort of help create a positive environment uh, where we live, a healthy environment, so that we can do things like grow food and, um, and grow fuel and uh, produce uh, fiber and, and clean water. So those regulating services are key. 
Um, and then cultural services become an even trickier um, uh, sort of set of things to, to value and to develop markets for. And so cultural services are things like the aesthetic value we get from being able to look out at a, <clears throat> a verdant green, lands uh, beautiful landscape, a pastoral landscape, or the spiritual services that we feel when uh, we, we uh, you know, go to the tropics and enjoy the biodiversity there, or go bird watching. Um, educational opportunities um, uh, are born out of uh, e a set of cultural ecosystem services as well. And in the recreational realm, you know, things like hunting, fishing, etc., become a little bit um, easier to value because, you know, we pay for um, our hunting license, we pay for our fishing license, etc. But the question is, do, 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 do those markets accurately reflect the value of those, uh, uh, of those services that we enjoy? And I think in a lot of cases, the answer is no. <clears throat> then we have these things called supporting ecosystem services, upon which these other three categories all, all sit. And, uh, those supporting services are things that happen within ecosystem services without which uh, there could be no provisioning services, no regulating services or cultural services. So the fact that there is soil at all, the fact that the soil has uh, developed underfoot, um, under, under plants, um, the fact that it's there and forms is uh, an important ecosystem services supporting service. And importantly, there are folks who talk about ecosystem disservices. And so you can imagine that the erosion of soil is considered an ecosystem disservice. Primary production, soil formation, nutrient cycling. These are gonna to be topics uh, in the coming weeks. So we'll talk more about these supporting services. Now critically, uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, when they developed this framework, uh, put the whole thing within this box, life on earth. Um, this is a very human centric, a, a very anthropocentric uh, viewpoint of the world, right? Um, uh, but it does put all these services sort of um, in the smack dab in the middle of this biodiversity realm. Biodiversity is a thread that runs through all of these services and uh, is important for all of them. Uh, and so that's why that, that it's situated that way. I want to move now to the right-hand side of the diagram, which lays out uh, constituents of well-being. Uh, whenever I see this and talk about it, I often uh, am reminded of uh, something I learned about when I was an undergrad, which is Maslow's Triangle of Well-Being. And uh, Maslow's Triangle, you might recall at, at the base of it were the basic human needs like uh, food and, and shelter and, and clothing and uh, uh, warmth and that sort of thing. And then as you work up the pyramid, you start to get um, things that are maybe less important for survival, but more important for your own well-being, individual well-being, as well as community well-being. And <clears throat> the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment has uh, rather simplified that here by just having these two categories, which are really about sort of on the left there, our own security and what do we need for a good life. What do we need to be uh, healthy? And um, what do we need for good social relations? These are all critical uh, factors and constituents of our, of our well-being. And then of course, on the right-hand side, um, they, re they sort of uh, uh, tip their hat to what was at the top of Maslow's triangle, which is, um, I think as Maslow put it, it was self-actualization, or the ability to be who you wanna be or what you wanna be and to pursue who or what you want to be. And that really comes down to freedom of choice and action. And so the, the hypothesis here, maybe not the hypothesis, the um, corollary of all this is that without these ecosystem services being provided by the world around us, these constituents of well-being are eroded or undermined. And so as you can see here, the arrows that connect particular ecosystem services to constituents of well-being, uh, some of them we know about very well. Obviously, if we don't have food, then our food security is gonna be low. Uh, our personal safety is gonna be low. Life is gonna be riskier, et cetera. 
And so there's a, a dark arrows pointing between <coughs> provisioning ecosystem services and some of the basics uh, for, good, for a good life, adequate uh, shelter and, and access to food and that sort of thing. But then also the width of the arrows is an indicator of how strong the linkages are between the relationships are between the services and these constituents of well-being. And um, uh, in particular, I think this is sort of um, boilerplate speak here for um, what kind of levers are there or dials can we turn in order to actually have some effect on these constituents of well-being. So that where the arrows are narrow, uh, it might be very difficult for us to have an effect on ecosystem services that affect constituents of well-being. But as they say in the report, these are hypotheses to be tested and interrogated and explored further. And uh, this really is meant to be sort of a conversation starter more than um, you know, a set of rigid rules uh, for, for, for the mapping of services to well-being. So that's the concept of ecosystem services. It's been very influential. It's dominated the literature now uh, since the turn of the 21st century. Um, and it's not without its critics as a concept. It's um, critics say, I think the main criticism would be that it lends itself to a commodifying of nature that devalues its intrinsic value, that, that undermines the intrinsic value of nature. So the intrinsic value of nature might be that uh, there is no price uh, that I can put on clean water. Um, without it, I simply can't survive. Uh, without it, I simply can't have uh, a good life. And so, um, and, and to put a price on it sort of, sort of indicates that some people could have it, others can't. Some people should have it, those who can afford it others can't. And so this commodification becomes a, um, a real problem uh, for, for a lot of people. And um, I would include myself uh, among those people. And while I feel that way, uh, certainly philosophically, I do admire and appreciate the, um, the way that ecosystem services are sort of pushed to the fore, the importance of these things that don't have markets explicitly developed for them. And it certainly has helped me <clears throat> personally and the folks I work with to motivate our research and to motivate our science by saying look it's super important that we understand the intricacies of nutrient cycling because that's explicitly linked to how we provision food fewer fuel and fiber and, and such and that's explicitly linked to the constituents of human well-being. So that's the concept of ecosystem services. We will use it, we will come back to it through the semester, but we also need to scrutinize and interrogate it and be careful with it. <clears throat>